Hello and welcome to another episode of Stitching Tales. I am Johanna Lundström. And I am Alena Jarpe. And we are the authors of the book Fit for Knits. And in our podcast we talk about all things sewing and also how to have your run your own sewing business. And when we first met, we met over the internet and we do have one common interest both of us that is that we do sew a lot with knits which is also the topic of our book so in today's uh, episode we want to talk about all things sewing with knits and we're going to share some of the stuff that we work are working on ourselves some mistakes i'm sure some of the struggles and of course a lot of tips on how to be successful when you're sewing with knits so maliana do you remember your first ever knit garment that you sewed? I do. The first garment I actually sewed was uh, a knit garment. Um, and yes, it was, I found it a few years ago and I tried it on. Um, it was a pyjama, like a t-shirt and shorts. Um, and it was so oversized on me uh, as an adult. Uh, I sewed this when I must have been like, nine years old or something but it was this was in the 90s um and you know the fashion in the 90s was so oversized and when i was younger i i mean i was just skin and bone basically so it must if it was oversized on me now when i'm adult like how <laughs> i don't understand like how big must the garment have been when i was younger then <laughs> but uh yeah I, I do remember it, it was uh, blue and black and uh yeah but uh hmm? <laughs> Maybe uh, it wasn't yeah. the most prettiest garment ever. <laughs> did you make it on your uh, sewing machine or how did you construct it? Yeah, it was uh, it was on a regular sewing machine. So I just uh, had uh, like zigzag uh, stitchings. But uh, yeah, I remember it was uh, it was fun to fun to do. What was uh, your first garment? Do you remember? Uh, yes, it was um, a Breton top or a sailor's top, which is like uh, those wide stripe... Um, Marino's top so it was in a cotton jersey and it wasn't white and navy striped it was white and apricot because this was in the 80s and I was I think I was uh, I must have been 14 13 or 14 when I made it and I had been making my own clothes for a while now and I, I really liked you know striped t-shirts and striped tops which incidentally are also wearing right now if you're watching the video on youtube because we also make this podcast as a video version you can see that I'm, i haven't my taste hasn't changed much since in the last 35 years but anyways so it was a, a cotton jersey uh i had no idea about sewing with knits there were no resources back in the 80s for techniques and stuff like that so I made it on my mother's uh, vintage uh, singer sewing machine. It was a wedding gift to her in the 60s. Uh, and I also used a regular zigzag. And I remember I had two massive struggles. And the first one was the neckline. Uh, I think I tried to use a facing, like a big bulky facing. Uh, and I had no idea. It was maybe like five centimeters wide. <laughs> and uh and it was about two inches wide so the facing on the inside and it was i had no idea how to attach it because it was such a light jersey so the facing was kind of bulky so then i i i think i cut away the the um the neckline so it was like a boat neckline so i cut the facing away and instead i uh, just folded back the uh, seam allowance uh, so of course the neckline was a bit wider then because I removed the seam allowance. Just a bigger and, and bigger and bigger. Big, yeah, it got bigger, bigger, bigger. And that was just before sewing. And then I just turned it back and then I zigzagged around it and it, then it was like gaping. <laughs> and, but I, I was, I mean, to me, it was still like, um, I was still happy with it because I managed to put it through. So that was my one struggle. And the second struggle was that I had no idea how to properly align the stripes. So if you would have looked from the side, you would see that the stripes were all over the place. I didn't, I d had no idea how to like mirror fabric and, you know, be careful while sewing. So I don't think I was even bothered by that at all. But I do remember wearing it to school and thinking I was pretty cool. So <laughs> I don't have, I, unfortunately I haven't saved that one, but, but 
I definitely ran into a few common struggles when, when sewing with knits uh, when I made my first top. And then I took a bit of a break, actually, <laughs> after that. I went back to women's. Yeah, it can, it can be a little bit tricky sewing uh, with the knit fabric, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> So what we're going to talk about today is, of course, a lot of those things that we learned along the years because we all are um, new, we are all beginners when we're starting out, right? So I think uh, many of us has uh, some stories up our sleeves, so to speak, when it comes to sewing with knits. It's definitely not a success story from the start. I think, in my opinion, at least, I don't know what you say, I think... Sewing when it is kind of deceptively easy, it's easy in one way because you don't have to like um, do as many steps. There are less details. There are less like you don't have to overcast edges usually, but uh, you will run into a few issues when you're sewing when it. So have, what are your like struggles, for instance, Malena, when you're sewing when it's what, what kind of issues do you tend to run into? Um, I think it's... Uh... Like uh, the stretch, definitely. I mean, that's the best thing and the worst thing. Uh, because, uh, yeah, the fabric is, it's alive. It uh, reacts to what you do. Um, so when you sew, when you sew on a regular sewing machine, for example, um, and the needle uh, pushes down, um, it could so easily also push down the fabric into the, like, the bobbin, uh, what do you call it? Um, so it's really easy that you, um, the fabric breaks or gets stuck in the machine or something if it's really like those really soft, uh, soft fabrics. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, just to handle the fabric, I would say can be, can be really tricky on those really soft and, uh, have, they have so much hand feel and so great drape and everything, but they are so difficult to work with. If, if you don't have a serger with a serger, it's so much easier. Yeah, because those wonderful soft knits or also those like beautiful rib knits with like tiny ribs that you can see sometimes in children's clothes. They are so wonderful to touch and feel, but they have are extremely difficult to control because, as you say, they are very delicate. You, It's so easy to break if you are, something gets stuck into it. Sometimes if you have to rip a seam, it's very easy to slip and then create a little bit of hole because the fabrics are so delicate. And also the fact that they are so difficult to control. So some fabrics that has, doesn't have a great lot of recovery, they tend to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. So the longer you work on the project, the bigger it gets. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, sometimes when you have sewn a seam and you have to unpick it, it uh, the fabric can so e easily be damaged and stretched out and don't recover. So sometimes, to be honest, if, for example, if, if it's the neckline, yeah, it might be actually better to cut away the fabric if it's possible to make, if it's okay that the neckline becomes a little bit bigger, that could actually be the best solution because it's, yeah... R r Unpicking a seam can be really, really tricky on on any fabric. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very true. It sometimes you can't uh, you can't recover it. You do have some great tips that we also share in our books fit for knits about how to steam back uh, the fabric. And sometimes you can also, for instance, if you are using if something has grown uncontrollable, sometimes you can pull it back. Also, uh, with using you know ribbing, you can pull it a little bit back like that because it can regain but it's it's difficult sometimes to to actually sometimes it's irreversible if you have them it would going to be wavy and you won't mm. get a nicely shaped uh, neckline and also i honestly i think some fabrics they should always be finished with some type of ribbing rather than trying to finish the neckline by stitching it or uh, hemming it because it's just so much easier if you just add cuffs, for instance, at the sleeves mm, and at definitely. the neckline and, and uh, at the waist. So that's also one yeah, of the things on, that I think. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree on all my, um, all. I have uh, a few um, patterns that are for knits and I always just have um, how to attach a neckband uh, for the neckline because I think like folding in and sewing with a twin needle I never get a good result like fine uh, in the front like when it's a little bit straighter but then when you have those curves it's just you get those drag lines uh, um, because it's uh, yeah it doesn't 
it's not really suitable sometimes for for those kind of fabrics to uh, fold and uh, not not on curved seam. You can't really fold and just uh, sew with a twin needle. On the bottom hem, it's much easier to fold um, and then sew with a twin needle. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I never do that on the neckline. It's just it's too difficult. Yeah, it is very very difficult. I find the only method that I, I find that works on some some necklines is that if you, which I, I should also say that I show this method in my book Sewing Active, where is that you first attach a narrow strip of clear elastic along the uh, edge of the neckline. So uh, the clear elastic is about five millimeters, so it's about a quarter of an inch, I think. Uh, you first attach it to the inside of the neckline and then you fold it over so the the neckline is um, the neckline folded is just the width of the clear elastic so it's super super narrow and then you can top stitch it uh, using a zigzag stitch or um, twin needle it's a method that is quite advanced but I, I find that that is one of the few methods that can if you're working with a very stretchy like lycra fabric for instance uh, active wear you can use it for leg openings and, and sleeveless tops. That's that's probably the only way, honestly, to control it. Because then you still keep the stretch due to the clear mm. elastic. And also you need to use very thin, lightweight clear elastic. Because otherwise, if you're top stitching over it, you might end up getting skip stitches. Because it's too many layers and the, the needle might have... Oh, it's too thick. So it might have problems uh, top stitching. But that is probably the only method that I, I think is uh, doable. Honestly, mm. unless yeah, you're but using... good because then it stabilizes the the seam and it's much easier to to sew. Yeah, yeah. Have you and ever tried course... the um, uh, that like the instead of uh, p pinning uh, with uh, pins or uh, needles, you glue um, and and you can wash away the glue. For example, if you fold a hem and uh, have glued or anything. Yes, I, I have used you tried that. that. Yes, I, yeah. I've used I have used different different methods i haven't tried it so much for neckline because that's the shaping i usually based if i if i i prefer that but uh i have uh, three different things uh, that i use regular stick glue the one you can buy in stores because it's usually very easy to wash away uh secondly if you want to ensure that the product is suitable for fabric is to buy a basting stick which is a, a basting glue either a pen or you can also spray i think but i, I use the pen uh, and the third is, which doesn't work on shaped seam, it only works on straight seam, is to use something called Wonder Tape, which is a double-sided, narrow, washable uh, tape. So it will re get removed once you wash it, but you have to be very careful. I wouldn't recommend I ironing over over the uh, heat or anything like that. So you have to definitely uh, remove the tape uh, as soon as it's done. But it's it's stitchable, so if it's a good quality tape, you can top stitch over it so it's great if you're having uh, problems with stretch out hemming for instance you can use the wonder tape i find that really helpful but actually regular uncolored glue stick that you buy it works okay i never mm. tried that actually it's just starch basically mm. Mm. yeah cool. but but always do a sample right <laughs> <laughs> obviously yeah i i don't co don't come for me unless it doesn't work but uh, it's 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 a pretty there are there are some ways of, of doing that and I, I also have, I I also based uh, I do I base a lot when I'm sewing with it for instance if I'm working doing hems uh, I am a big fan of um, basting but that also controls the prevents the hemline from stretching out and getting those diagonal drag lines because you might have problems with uneven feeding and I find that if I baste I have uh, much more control so usually a combination of basting. And a couple of pins. That's that's how I usually do it to be successful. Yeah, yeah. And the you said feeding um, the the feeding dogs on the on the machine. I uh, my two biggest uh, like best sewing tips are are that well first ch check the pressure pressure. I can't say this pressure. No, <laughs> the presser. Presser foot presser. pressure. Yeah. Presser foot pressure. <laughs> Because usually, especially if you sew a lot with woven, like you can have a, have a lot of pressure on uh, on the pre presser foot. Uh, but if you are sewing with knits, it's gonna be too much pressure, and then the feeding dogs is gonna pull out the fabric, and they also are gonna pull more the underlayer compared to the top layer. So that's why you get those drag lines, 
and also the seam gets so stretched out and becomes wavy. So loosen up the press, uh, pressure a little bit when you sew, uh, sew with knit. And this, especially for home sewing, like regular machines, but also on uh, sew sergers or overlockers. I really, really recommend it, this. And the second, like always do this, is uh, pressing with an iron. Lots and lots of steam. Like I, I spend equally much of time uh, with my iron than I do with my sewing machine. Because every seam I first, especially if I uh, use a really soft uh, jersey fabric, I always, well, I sew the seam and then I press the seam when it's like closed. So it regain, it's, uh, so yeah, it recovers, so it doesn't, um, uh, so it's not wavy anymore. And then I open it up and uh, like press open the seam. Uh, and I always do it from, uh, th from the wrong side because uh, uh, the knitting structure can be damaged if you uh, press it too hard with an iron and it comes it gets like these shiny shiny marks um, so that can be really difficult to get out or uh, and it ah, doesn't look so nice so uh, always a lot of steam and from uh, from the wrong side I think that's the best way to get uh, like um, like a really good uh, so it doesn't look home sewn if you know what I mean that's such a great tip because I'm, I think maybe not everyone is aware of that you need to press knits because you might have a dis because we are all we all know or have been taught that we should press as we go when we sew with wovens you know you press open the seam allowance you press like everything there's a very specific method and routine to doing that and but to get that as Malena says the professional result you definitely need to use an iron when sewing with knits as well because otherwise you will the seams won't look flat and you get uh, like um, ridges it doesn't you know and, and the sleeves everything looks like unfinished as it it you need you want those flat seams and yeah it's also important as you say to press on the go because normally when you're sewing sleeves on knit patterns you do it on the flat meaning that you first attach the sleeve cap to the armhole before sewing the side and the sleeve seam so it's very easy to press that sleeve because you're doing it on the flat so you don't even need to have like a sleeve iron board because you can just press it flat so that's also another thing why it's so important to press as you go because once you finish the garment you it will be much more difficult to access stuff and same with neckline as well because you you attach the neckline as soon as you sewn the shoulder seams uh, so again it's flat so it's much easier to press and shape than it's if, if you had already full sewn the full garment you're like hmm maybe I should do some pressing <laughs> yeah and I always uh, the only exception I think would be like swimwear like those kind of lycra fabric I mean those those are difficult to, to press um, but otherwise I always start before I even cut the fabric I always press it so it's uh, nice and flat and then uh, yeah after every I mean I sew a couple of seams and then I press them uh, like I always press it before you sew over that previous seam if that makes sense so uh, it's it's really huge it makes a huge difference um, like it really regains it's uh, because they always going to be stretched out when you sew like even with an overlocker they are going to be stretched out and uh, become a little bit wavy but that usually recovers when you have uh, steam and heat so i really mm. really recommend recommend it yeah and also as you mentioned some fibers are quite delicate so i should definitely also do a little bit of a test before you start ironing because usually you need really low heat on most knit fabrics I, I find to still get good result and and even if it's made with natural fiber it's usually have uh, some spandex or lycra content uh, which is much more sensitive to heat so you still have to be careful with the pressing so I wouldn't go even if you're making like a cotton t-shirt I wouldn't go for the cotton setting if you have an iron that labels that I would definitely go for a lower setting and test and see as Madalena says also if you get those pressing marks which can be permanent uh, so I definitely that's my experience that, that you, you must it's much better to go lower compared to uh, the same type of fiber composition on, on a woven fabric yeah and it most most of the time you sew with uh, polyester threads 
and they are I mean polyester is plastic so that can uh, that can melt if it's too if you have too high heat so uh, definitely it's yeah it's more safer to start with a lower lower setting yeah so press as you go it's just like ev everyone has always told you and, and sometimes i forget and i o always regret it <laughs> <laughs> i think that's that's one of the things even though uh, i mean we are both very experienced zoe but sometimes you know you can get in that flow where you're like <laughs> everything is such a nice flow that you you just want to keep on sewing and oh i can iron later i can just want to do that and that and you always forget yourself so it's also good to have your um for like mental to uh, me to make it easier mentally is to set up your iron station before like the iron board and plug in that iron before you start sewing because if you need to set everything up when you're sewing you might you know postpone it <laughs> Yeah, and I actually, when we are talking about, I, I was in, the, in my uh, studio uh, yesterday uh, sewing uh, some samples and uh, obviously had my iron um, on. And I think the my best buy ever is the is a little timer um, that I like plug in my iron to. Uh, so you can have it like it switches off automatically after one hour, two hours, three hours. And now we are, when we are talking about pressing, I was like, shoot, I uh, I did some pressing yesterday. Did I unplug my iron? Yes, I know I did, uh, but I have this safety, like, <laughs> you know, after three hours, it switches off anyway. So that is actually a really good thing to, to buy. It's nothing sewing related actually, but it's really, it's a good thing to have because uh, yeah, I, um, it's so easy to forget to unplug your iron. Yeah, that's a great tip. And I, you know, I am I am one of those persons. I keep thinking I should buy one of those timers, but I never do. But I <laughs> promise, until the next podcast episode, I should have gotten. I will get one of those timers because also I am. I have my own sewing studio. If you're watching the video, you can see it behind me, and uh, it's not located in my home, so. You know, they, I, there's no chance I will pass by in an hour later and see that the iron is on because I've already walked home and will probably not be back until the next day. So, yeah, it's definitely a very, very nice, very important tip to have. Yeah, only annoying thing is at first I had it for like one hour and then it would switch off. But then when you, you know, you start to iron, it's like, wh why is nothing happening? It's like, oh, right, it switches off again and again and again. So now I have it on uh, three hours so I can uh, do some proper sewing uh, during that time. That, that's a very wonderful tip. I, I agree with you because it's so it's so annoying. And some some iron also tends to um, like auto clothe off. So you lose all the heat. So you have to like start again. I, I have one of those like steaming stations. So they they shut themselves down <laughs> that, like, which is thanks, good but, but no <laughs> no but it's also really annoying that you have to start waiting for it to heat up again like for a really long time um and another thing that we briefly mentioned was the sewing order and i thought it was really interesting to talk about when you're sewing tops for instance because there is a very distinct sewing order that also is different from uh, woven fabrics uh, so I would say start with the shoulder seam because that's the first seam that will keep everything together. And secondly, I say sew the neckline before you're stitching the sleeves or sewing the sleeve. Would you agree with me, Malena, on that? Yeah, I mean, technically you can do either way, but I think it's so much easier to do the neckline first because you have basically less fabric to, to handle. Um, if you haven't attached the sleeves yet. Yeah. And also if you are working with one of those soft, wonderful, lovely cotton fabrics or bamboo fabrics and stuff that tends to grow, uh, the more you um, fill with the fabric and doing other stuff, for instance, inserting the sleeve, there's an increasing chance that the neckline will stretch out when you're handling the rest of the garment. So that's why I also think it's a good idea to to start with the neckline as soon as possible to avoid those issues as well. So that's that's the so start with the shoulder seam, then do the neckline, and then we do the sleeves. And yeah. as I say, we sew it on the flat. Why well, would you say that it's better to sew it on the flat than doing sewing the sleeves first and then inserting them the, like you would on um, a woven um, top or blouse? <coughs> oh, sorry. 
I think it's just easier when you have negative uh, ease on the on the sleeve head. Um, it's easier to insert it that way, and it also goes a little bit faster pinning it, and uh, then you slow uh, so the side seam and um, the sleeve in side seam in one continuous seam, and um, that's basically just how you do it in the um, like in the industry. So that is uh, it's a little bit easier, quicker, quicker way to do it. Yeah, it's, it's easier also because if you're, it can be a little bit tri- f- uh, when you already have s- like two circles that you need to fit into each other. I also find it much more difficult to control and evenly distribute the uh, sleeve seam line towards the arm whole sleeve line because it's it's just much more fiddlier, but. Uh, and you know, trying to find the notches to them align when everything is flat and nice, you can really just gauge exactly where the shoulder seam notch is, where the front seam, uh, front shoulder, uh, front armhole notch is, and the back. So it's much easier, I find, to just have control and like visually align everything. Uh, and there's less risk of you know twisting the sleeve when you're sewing because you have to like, especially if you're working on a tight fitting top. Uh, you don't have much space because you have like this really narrow and then you're going to try to sew when you have to like fiddle and you're going to stretch something out and even worse if you were working a serger if you get like a second layer of fabric underneath and then the knife cuts through yes, it, it to all of us <laughs> yes raise your raise your hands if that happens so uh, I have many many of those garments especially I think the first couple of years when I got myself a serger that was like the I, I always got my heart racing when I was attaching the sleeves because it was like oh uh, I, I ended up you know getting because uh, sometimes I, I cut into the the arm the front piece when I was at the curve here so I I went to a store and bought this really cute flower appliques <laughs> so I attached them on, on on only one. I should perhaps do it symmetrically and also put it on the other, put the, put the other, other side. But I only put it on one side. I don't I don't know why or what my thinking process was about that. But uh, so if that could if that happens to you, if you're if you're okay with uh, you know uh, having some appliques or something like that, you can you can save your garment if it's just a tiny. Uh, but it's it's hard to mend uh, 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 a stretchy fabric that has been cut through. <laughs> it's very it's very difficult to fix it in. Yeah, you know, yeah. So so annoying when you realize it. It's just like, oh yeah. No, I've been there, done that a couple of times. Yeah. So go go slow. Even though the surgery is a fast, crazy machine, mm-hmm. there's no harm in in going slow when you're inserting sleeves because it's much better to sew a little bit, just slightly adjust. The pieces so a little bit more uh, you know making sure that the the knives are aligning at the fabric edge and cutting properly and also to ensure that it's cut evenly uh, so you don't have to rush through those steps because it, it won't get better just because you do it faster i mean you just it's much better to go slow and sew for a little bit just because it's it's a tricky it's a tricky it's like um adventurous trail right trying to sew the this because it happens a lot there's some different curves and winding things yeah. happening it's yeah not a two straight line. different shapes yeah yeah no absolutely go slow go slow on that and uh i would say something that really is helpful is uh, preparing um also when you after you sew the side seam uh, and the sleeve if you have a like a long sleeve t-shirt or a children's t-shirt or something like um the bottom hem at the sleeve can be really small and tight and that can be really tricky to hem so you can hem that first and then you sew the uh, inseam because then it's already hemmed and it's going to be a lot easier to to get a nice uh, um a nice seam basically and i always always again pressing i press the hem first uh when i um, before i sew it and i also um, I always press it like before I uh, sew the side seams because then I can have the bottom hem, for example. Then I can have it flat uh, on the ironing board, and it's just so much easier to fold up and uh, and steam it um, compared to if you have sewed already both uh, seams and then you have 
you have a circle basically that you need to fold and uh, it's just a lot trickier to do it. So I always prep it before and uh, then I can use a lot less uh, needles as well uh, when I actually sew because it actually stays in place already. So that's, yeah. that's a really, I, I really recommend it. Yeah, that's a fantastic tip. I think, as you say, it's so much easier. And also measuring, like measuring the fold to make sure that it's even so it's not like wider in one space it's also so much easier when you're doing it on the flat because then you can just check everything whereas when you have this round shape it's it's really really difficult to get exact even fold all over especially on the narrow sleeves uh, so that's a great suggestion also if you're sewing uh, leggings that has like a very narrow leg opening again using the method Melena describes to first hem or at least at least press up the hem before you stitch that that helps so much because it's again it's it's so difficult it's also easy to stretch out the fabric because you have to navigate such narrow uh, it and it doesn't really regardless if you're using a, a regular sewing machine or a cover stitch it's still a, such a narrow circle that it's very very difficult to not accidentally stretch it out when you're moving that tiny little tube around so it can definitely help and you don't have to worry because the seam will still be enclosed i think the only tricky bit is that you have to be really uh, mindful to make sure that the the seams align so you don't get like a, a half a centimeter or a centimeter or a quarter of an inch uh, that one is longer because that's going to mm, be really visible yeah, so you have to really uh, make sure that they are aligned and you know have some pin at the end or stuff like that because sometimes as yeah. you know it's easy that one layer stretches out a little bit more so that's that's the only i think issue that you might run into and of course you, you need to secure the seam as well but but i i, I do it a lot as well because yeah. it just it just makes things so much easier yeah uh, yeah and if you do want to hem it after you sewn the inside seam um, just fold uh, the whole garment inside out because then it's easier also, I think, to um, to hem a narrow bottom sleeve hem or something to have it if you have it inside out. Yeah, so um, you're, you're basically having the folded hem towards you, up towards you when you're sewing instead of sewing from the right side. I, I totally agree with that. It gives you more control and also prevents the less risk of stretching out. So yeah. the, these are the kind of things that... Uh, no one told us right when we started sewing with knits it's it's that's why we're talking about this today because there's so many of this kind of like insights that you get uh after a while and you find out someone has shown this method or you realize it yourself so a lot of these kind of tiny things that makes a huge difference and so there's like also it's good to say that you know each method it works for different people so maybe for you you can try something different but but if you're having struggles, for instance, with, with hemming, I definitely recommend the kind of method that we are talking about right now. Uh, should we talk a little bit about uh, different type of machines as well? Mm -hmm. Because you do have uh, at least three different machines, to my knowledge, uh, to pick from. Uh, yes, that I use. The, yes, you use and I do too. Uh, I so might have others as well, but <laughs> they're not in use. <laughs> I'm not hoarder. I'm trying to be not. I, I actually did a video about that because uh, I have three different machines and I've uh, and as I usually because when, when when you tell people they don't sew they're like what why do you have three different machines I mean how many machines do you need to sew it's like you do need three uh, but it was so fun in the comments on that YouTube video where I did a studio tour uh, there were people like having 10 different machines because you know and there's also machines that can do like buttonholes for instance there are very many specialty machines if you want to go that route or, you know, heavy duty machines if you want to sew with leather or very like thick fabric. So if you if you go all in on this hobby, so to speak, you can definitely you <laughs> definitely go crazy because there are so many different options. Uh, but we have three we have three machines in use, we should say. So I guess everyone has a sewing machine, which is a question that I get a lot. Uh, can I make a knit garment if I only have a sewing machine and no serge or cover stitch machine? And what would you say to that question, Malena? Yes, you can. Um, I mean, you're not going to get as nice seams as if you would have a serge overlocker. 
But yes, you can absolutely uh, you, you can absolutely make them because the zigzag uh, seam is it is very stretchy. Um, so you definitely can get a long way way with that. And I actually when I like check um, looked at my uh, bought underwear for example with uh, that has like a lace edge, uh, it's actually sewn with just a zigzag. So yeah, they do it in the in the industry as well. Yeah, it's great because it has so much stretch because of the zigzag. Uh, there is so much uh, thread and stitching, so when you stretch it out, you know it gets straighter and straighter, which gives why it has so much give. Because if you're using a regular uh, straight stitch on it, as soon as you stretch it out, the seam will break because there's no extra thread that can. It works like because the thread w- almost works like a coil. You know, you have to when you if the if the coil has those coils, right? I think it's called. <laughs> As uh, if you don't know, we are English is not our first language. We are both Swedish speaking, so sometimes we get a little bit lost for word. But you, spring, I think spring is the 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 thing, and coils are what ma- is make the spring. So it's basically the same principle. So you can think of the the thread as the coil in a spring. So if there's more thread loops in an area, there will be uh, more um, stretch, for instance. Uh, so that's why a straight stitch doesn't work because there's no give. There's no, nothing that can be stretched out. So it's basically it doesn't work like a, a spiral or a, a something elastic like that. So that's why it's so important that you need to have a different kind of seam. Um, a lot of s- modern and fairly modern sewing machines also have a, an overlock seam that looks kind of similar to a uh, serger or overlocker seam. Um, my personal thing, I think it's it's very it's very durable and has great stretch, but it's usually an absolute nightmare to rip. Uh, so you, that's my opinion of it. I, I I I like it, but you have to be sure that you know what you're doing because if something's wrong, you're going to ruin the fabric if you're using a delicate fabric. At least that's my experience. What what's your take on those like sewing machine overlock seams? Yeah, I have actually never like used them uh, since I always had an overlocker. Um, but yeah, I I can't I can only imagine how difficult it's going to be to to unpick them. And I also don't they stretch out the edge quite a lot if you're so really close to the edge, or do you still sew a little bit away from the edge? No, it's basically it's basically meant to enclose the edge. So the yeah. it's usually have around uh, like a quarter of an inch or five five millimeter width. So it's it's usually called overlock. So it's meant okay. as opposed yeah. to, uh, yeah. but it's. Uh, it but I mean, ca- if you don't have a serger, it's a great uh, great seam to to use because uh, they uh, they are really. I can imagine that they look really like they they are gonna stretch uh, stretch a lot. Yeah, they have fantastic stretch. So it's basically the sewing machine is going back and forth, back and forth, creating uh, that kind of stretch that is similar to a uh, serger overlock seam. But of course, because there's so m- much going back and forth, that's also why you have so many stitches, which makes it really difficult to rip. Uh, but uh, it's definitely a good option, I think, because you will get a really nice finish uh, if you if you want that, because then it will cover the edges if you're using. You can also, of course, use a wider seam allowance and then trim away the extra fabric as well. So you can try and see, because sometimes if it over- overlocks the edges, there's also a tendency of uh, the fabric getting stuck inside the um, the lower part of the sewing machine where the bobbin area is. So you have to be a bit careful with that as well, which you don't have when you're using a serger in the same way, that it won't get pulled through, pulled through inside. That's yeah, and a good thing to mention when um, if you use a regular sewing machine, there is usually like a universal needle or a woven needle as a default needle. Uh, but you have to have a, a stretch needle or a ballpoint needle uh, when you sew with um, uh, with jersey, because then the tip of the needle is gonna be rounded. On a regular needle, it's gonna be very pointy uh, when you sew with woven. And if it if you use a pointy needle when sewing with uh, knits, it can uh, break um, it can break the threads in in the fabric, and then you get a hole, and that can um, what do you say like it's, it it can spread the hole. Yeah, um, like yeah, it unravels almost. Yeah, mm. 
when you're yeah, when you're but using if, it if you have a rounded uh, needle, it uh, like it gets in between the um, the the fabric, so then it doesn't create a hole. It actually just goes in between all the all the fabric. So uh, that's a really good uh, thing to have uh, uh, a specific uh, jersey needle, mm -hmm. and it also can prevent from. Uh, um, what is it? Jumping stitch? No, what do you say? Yeah, uh, skip stitches. Skip, yeah, yeah, skip stitches. Yeah. yeah. So the needle is, is very uh, important to have. And if you ever like accidentally hit uh, when you sew and you hit uh, like uh, the needle that you have, like a pinning needle, um, a good thing is to actually change the sewing machine needle because it probably has been damaged uh, at the edge then and then it could create holes as well. And you usually don't see these holes in the fabric because they are so small, but then after you wash the garment, then it's going to be visible. And uh, yeah, then it's <laughs> so sad <laughs> that you have spent so, so much time uh, making the whole garment and it's like just tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, holes everywhere yeah and they're so difficult to mend sometimes you can do it using like a regular sewing thread if in the matching just but it's very difficult i find to yeah. so hopefully I've, you could fix it like mending it especially if it's close to the seam you won't see it if it's on the side seam but it does happen and also needle size if you're using or you're working with a really delicate thin knit fabric definitely go down the needle size as well because I, I find that can also prevent those uh, holes from forming if you're using a needle that is a bit too too large um, as well so it's it's a, it's a little bit tricky for sure but yeah I totally agree with you Malena use a ballpoint needle I think technically a universal needle is a ballpoint needle but it doesn't it isn't round enough for no, knit fabric no. so you should definitely even though it says universal it's not really universal <laughs> That's more towards the woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, so that's a really good tip as well. Uh, then we talked about sewing machine. And then I think the next machine that you might consider if you get into sewing with knits is a serger or an overlocker, as we say in Europe, in many countries. So uh, Malena, uh, why should we get an overlocker or a serger? You get really nice seams and uh, nice finishes of the of the seams, and it's really like sure it can just do one thing, uh, but it does that really well. And sure, with a little different settings, you can have uh, like a baby lock uh, that is a little bit thinner and uh, those kind of things. But it's no, it's really I love my um, I love my uh, overlocker. I definitely is the machine that I absolutely use the most, mm. and uh, I have. Uh, it, not Ber Bernina. I have a Bernina regular home sewing machine, and then uh, it's their own overlocker as well. So I, call, I think it's called Burnett. Uh, I'm not really sure, but it's like 20, 25 years old or something. It's like it was white in the beginning, but now the plastic has turned all yellowy. Uh, but it's still going like so good. So I, I, I love it. It's really, it's a good investment, definitely. Yeah. They don't seem to break as much overlockers. They seem to be really sturdy workhorses. Yeah. And yeah, if you have a, yeah, I know I have used. I had one cheaper overlocker as well, uh, but it just I don't know. It, it was something with a set. It it didn't work at, at all as uh, as the seams were. There were a lot of issues with it. Um, so I think like. Quality quality machine is absolutely the way way to go here. Yeah, and I, I would always re recommend get a second hand quality machine compared to a new cheap machine because uh, the quality is uh, yeah it's it's worth it definitely. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And also, you should be a bit careful because at least here in Sweden, I think that's common in many countries. Some uh, like uh, bigger grocery stores they sometimes have. Uh, they sell sewing machines and also I've seen sergers and sometimes they can have, they have, a, they are very cheap and they can have like a, a famous brand name, but I, I do suspect that they are the lower end of that because I, I know people that have bought uh, sewing machines that way from like a grocery store campaign, like the monthly offer. Uh, and they seem to usually have many issues. So I don't really feel comfortable buying uh, a sewing machine in a grocery store as well. Plus, of course, if you have any issues, you, you can't go to the like uh, milk section and ask someone <laughs> to 
<laughs> you have to you probably have to send it to the manufacturer instead uh so you you won't get like a skilled uh, uh professional to to turn to and, and I, I can only imagine having to deal with the warrant warranty issues if you buy yourself your sewing machine at like a, a grocery store but it, it's pretty common to see that so definitely buyers beware i very much agree with malena much better to get a used sewing machine in if that's the if money is tight uh, and you would get a really nice quality. Uh, my serger is the baby lock, which was insanely expensive. That's the most expensive sewing machine I have gotten. It's the baby lock ovation uh, and it cost, yeah, like a cheap used car, <laughs> like a bad, bad used car. Uh, <laughs> But again, um, people have uh, have had this machine for decades and they are so, so fond of it. So I'm very happy with my investment as well. I've had it for about eight years now and it's been running like clockwork extremely well. So it's it's something I highly recommend uh, again to buy to buy the brands that get the good reviews and uh, that people in that you trust are also recommending. I definitely agree with you. Uh, Another benefit about using a serger is that it's so fast, right? Yeah, yeah, it's really fast. So if you, it does, you know, it's incredibly, if you're sewing a straight seam, you basically just uh, hit the pedal and then you're done. Whereas, yeah. for instance, if you're using a sewing machine and those overlock stitches that I talked about previously, because the sewing machine has to go back and forth and maybe sideways, you know, just sewing a couple of centimeters will take like forever. Um, and the third thing, which I also think is so good about the serger, is the fact that you have the differential feed, which controls the speed of the feed dogs. Because one of the most common thing that you have, as you mentioned earlier, Malena, is that uh, the um, the fabric will get stretched out when you're sewing. But by controlling the speed of the feed dogs, you can prevent the fabric from stretching out. So, instance, if you're working with a fabric that is very tends to stretch out you can uh, increase the differential feed a little bit and then it will keep pull it will be pulled together automatically so again you should always do a test sample to see because it can be very different uh, depending on um, so for, for instance a lot of knit fabrics have less stretch lengthwise even though they're four-way stretch than crosswise so if you're sewing a side seam you don't you usually can use the the regular like normal differential feed but if you would do like a cross seam for instance uh, on a garment where you have like a horizontal seam like a yoke or anything like that i would say that maybe you you could try to see if the ha increasing differential feed might prevent from getting wavy seams so you, there's no like one setting that works all the time you need to experiment i think yeah definitely yeah it's um it's really, and that's why it's so good to do test tests and also pull uh, the seam on on the test. So you see that uh, even though, like, yes, it looks very nice and it hasn't stretched out anything, but maybe it's even too tight. Then it doesn't stretch anything. Like it doesn't have enough stretch. So um, definitely try to um, stretch the seam as well to see how how good um, good they are. Yeah. Because when you're sewing with knits, stretching knits, you definitely you want to keep the stretch. You don't want you don't want anything to be rigid because then you're working against no. the fabric and not not with yeah. it. Mm. No, absolutely. And then we have the third machine, which is probably the the next up on the ladder. Uh, and speaking about a machine that only do one thing, it's uh, even even more specific because at least with the serger, you can also hem, you can do like a roll hem, you can do like blind hem stitching. You can also, of course, finish the edges of woven fabric as well. So you get a really nice professional finish. So a serger is a bit more versatile, but a cover stitch machine, what does that do, Malena? And why should we get one? <laughs> Well, it basically just does hems, I think. Um, it could also, of course, uh, you, you could sew um, like bindings with it. Uh, and I actually have that. The, I bought it when I bought my uh, cover lock. I also bought the really, it, it looks so advanced, uh, the thing that you attach so you can uh, like sew nice uh, bindings. I still haven't used it. And it was like three, four years ago since I bought it. Um, so, uh, yeah, any day now, any day, <laughs> we'll see. 
Yeah, it's definitely a learning curve. It's definitely a learning curve. And if you're struggling with sewing binding, I have many resources I can recommend. First of all, you can check out my book, Master the Cover Stitch Machine. You can also go to my website, thelostitch.com, where I have a tutorial where I talk about the different things that you can try if you're struggling. And I also have a video sewing course, Cover Stitch Success, where I also talk about how to be successful with binding and you know the kind of settings you need to experiment with and all the placements and everything. So there's definitely a learning curve when it comes to sewing binding, but it's very, very popular finish, especially if you're sewing like children's clothes or active wear. Sometimes binding is a better way to finish the neckline and, and the sleeve openings. And uh, I um, have a friend, Erika Syskreen, which is um, a, a store here in Sweden. She sells cover stitch equipment. Uh, like attach binders and everything like that and she says globally so you can definitely check her out Erika's, Erika's Syskreen she's also on Instagram and she has actually she she's a binder binding pro so she's now finishing uh, hems uh, the bottom of the hems so I when I visited her in her shop recently she had finished uh, like a tunic uh, with binding and I think mm -hmm. she also had um, like a children's skirt that was also finished with the contrasting binding and it looked really oh, cool. Really yeah. yeah. So that if you already have your, have your sewing machine set on binding and you don't want to remove the attachment because uh, then you, there's nothing on the, the garment that you need to use the cover stitch for a regular fold up. So you basically just bind mm -hmm. the neckline, the sleeve openings and the, the hem. Yeah, yeah, because that's the I think the like the biggest like uh, I don't want to set up it uh, for just one seam and then remove it to be able to sew the the other hem if I like do a binding on the neckline and then have to remove it after just one seam. It just seems like a I don't know so much time to just set, set it up. But um, I haven't tried it, so I don't know how fast you can do it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it definitely, it's uh, because of the placement, it's really nice to do multiple projects when you have set it up, because usually you need to be really meticulous about the placement and the stitch settings, depending on what type of fabric you're using. So it can, uh, I can, I, I see you and I hear you and I, I, I don't use it as much as I probably should either, because uh, again, of the same reason that it's just too much uh, fiddling. Um, yeah, as uh, you said, Marlena, it's it's basically just made for for hemming, uh, and you can also use uh, it has a single seam, the chain stitch, which you can also use for like top stitching and decorative purposes as well. And uh, you can also use it for basting because it's very easy to remove. So usually, cover stitch machine, most modern cover stitch machine usually have a setting where you can either use one needle, which is a chain stitch, or two needle, which is like a two needle cover stitch, which is what you see on pretty much all professionally made knit garments. And then they all, most modern ones have three needles, so you can either get the three rows or you can reverse it and get, if you sew, sew the straight stitches on the reverse side, you will get the decorative uh, like um, overlock seam on the, the looped overlock seam on the, the right side. And now uh, there are more advanced versions that do a top cover stitch as well. So you get this really, when you, when you look at like modern activewear, you will see that the, the hems are sewn with a much more intricate thread. So they're not like two needles or three needles. It's that similar to the, the reverse side, but on the right side. So it's, I think it's usually called a top cover stitch, which has a, a fifth thread spool. So those, those are sort of like the most modern machines. I, d I don't have those myself, but I next machine I get, I will probably get one of those, but I know it's it's a learning curve. I, I've, I've used it in the past and it's it's a little bit tricky to get it right. Yeah, I would say that those are more like industrial machines. Uh, it's very, it's not so common to have as a home sewing machine, mm -hmm. I would say. You don't need it. I think you will do very nicely with the... I think most most have three needles today if you get one. So I think you will be more than happy with that. So, but, yeah. so I wouldn't say you need to have a cover stitch machine, but if you no, are... I mean, I got uh, I got one three four years ago, um, 
and so yeah i managed without <laughs> and i've been sewing uh i mean since i was uh, very young so uh, i mean definitely if you want to have nice uh, hems uh, on knits uh but it's not like you get you get by with a regular sewing machine and a serger like you will be fine with those two machines yeah absolutely absolutely you, you can uh, on a regular sewing machine you can use the twin needle stitch or you can use a zigzag stitch or you can use my favorite if you're using a more stable fabric the blind hem stitch so you get a really um, invisible stitch on the the outside and on a serger you can do a roll hem which or the lettuce hem so we, you know the kind of wavy curved there's usually also a blind hem stitch function that you can use on the serger as well and you can also just simply overlock the edges and just leave them raw like that just with a so if you so you can basically finish there are ways of finishing or you can combine if you like the finish of the um you can first overlock the edge of the fabric and perhaps use the differential feed uh, a little bit higher because then it pulls the fabric back and then you can press it in and top stitch it on a, a sewing machine using the twin needle because then you get the best of both worlds you get the the overlock will help the fabric to keep its shape and you will get a really nice finish uh, so it looks a bit more professional because you don't see the the zigzag will be hidden because it's hidden by the overlock seam so if you have a serger and a sewing machine, you can get like really nice result. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you get, you can you can do so many things with uh, with those those two machines. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, so uh, I think we've probably we spoken now for about an hour about sewing with knits <laughs> because we 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 keep joking that we can talk forever about sewing, and I think every yeah. episode that we do, we, we definitely <laughs> prove that 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 is how we do it so but we should also say that if you want to learn more about us and the stuff that we do we do have several things and offerings that pertains to knits for instance Malena you have uh, several sewing patterns made for knits right yeah um I have uh, started with the basics and I have joggers and t-shirts and uh, now I'm uh, working on uh, a little more uh, not advanced top, but uh, it has a little bit more details at the front. So that I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to that. And I also have uh, sewing patterns, uh, a cardigan and a pair of leggings and uh, a puff top. If you're watching um, the video version of this, I'm wearing this, this girly with puff sleeves. Uh, so it's a long sleeve and a short sleeve version. And But also I have so many resources when it comes to sewing when it's I have... Uh, Two books that are talking about uh, that I've written myself. We're going to talk about the third book soon. Uh, I have a book called Sewing Activewear, which talks about how to sew with knits, and also Master the Cover Stitch Machine, which talks also only about how to use the Cover Stitch Machine with lots of tutorials. And me and Malena has written a book together, which is called Fit for Knits. And should we mention a little bit about what that book is about? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, mainly about, uh, well, getting good fitted knitted garment, like uh, how to do pattern adjustments, but also we talk a lot about how to sew with knits, uh, because as you, well, I mean, we are talking uh, about this for an hour now, the seams affect so much when you sew with, uh, sew with knits. Um, so we definitely had a lot of things to cover in the book for how to how to get uh, good good seams, uh, basically. And you also have you have so much information on your blog. Yep. Like w when I Google something, it's all, it's usually your blog <laughs> that comes up. That's that's wonderful to hear. Yes, I have a, a it's like a separate category just with the tutorials for how to sew with knits, and also you can check out my YouTube channel, The Lost Stitch TV, where I also have lots of tutorials on how to sew with. With knits from everything from a regular sewing machine to serger or cover stitch machine so i think between us we have you covered when it comes to sewing <laughs> with knits so and if we don't just drop us a note and we can see if we can make that into some further content or maybe a topic on this uh, show uh, thank you so much for listening or watching as we said if you're watching this on youtube you can also listen to this in your regular podcast app app and if you want to see how we look like when we are doing this podcast, and you can hop over to my YouTube channel, The Lost Stitch TV, and then you can see the video version of this pod. Thank you so much for listening or watching. I am Johanna Lundström. And I'm Malena Jarpe. Bye-bye.
拜拜。